Let's get you a tidbit of the exclusive on ET Now. Sanjeev Bikchandani and Dipinder Goel, they come together for a chat like never before. Uh, the InfoEdge co-founder shares his rationale for keeping the faith in Zomato's growth map, saying that they are on track for profitability. And he also talks about what's on his radar next. Sanjeev, uh, you're, the, you're the OG of the startup world. You were an investor, you understand this space. Uh, should so I call you? The first time somebody called me an OG yeah. was a colleague of yours, a former colleague of yours, and I had to ask her what it meant. Okay, I, <laughs> this is about a few months ago. Now, yes, now yes, I know what it means. Yes, huh? yes, yes. So you don't like the word OG? No, no, I'm a, it's cool, millennial? It's millennial. Your companies are invested <laughs> in that. <laughs> uh, a lot has changed in the last one year. Exactly a year ago, there was a tinge of euphoria, a lot of excitement, a lot of uh, re-rating in terms of where these companies were headed. But in the last 12 months, de-rating, fear, anxiousness. Where do you think some of the consumer tech and fintech stocks will settle, and why? It depends on the fundamentals. Uh, you know, we have witnessed these cycles earlier. We saw it in 2000 when the dot, first dot-com bubble burst. We saw it in 2008-9 when Lehman went down. Uh, InfoEdge uh, corrected by 75% at that stage. Uh, and then slowly it came back. So if your fundamentals are good and you keep on growing and just focus on the business and not your stock price, uh, it's going to be all right. It will be different for different companies. So what I was advised in 2007 or eight when Lehman went down by somebody who I regard as very smart, says, market goes up, you run the business. Market goes down, you run the business. Market goes sideways, you run the business. And that's it. That's what Dipinder to say, because he does not look at the stock price. He said, look, I've looked at the stock price only three or four times in the last six months. But you are an investor, which means you need to look at the stock price. Not really. We are long-term investors. So we don't even track our own stock price daily. Right? Uh, so we... The conversations we have are not about the stock price. The conversations we have are about what's happening in the business, what's happening on path to profit, what's happening on growth, what's happening with competition, what's happening on any new initiative, what's happening on Blinkit. Uh, so we have operational discussions more than financial discussions. You've not, you've not parred down the investments in Zomato, while other anchor investors, other big investors have bought their stake down. You've not, you're still the largest investor in Zomato. What gives you the confidence that this is an investment which already has been a multi-bag investment for you, could still create uh, wealth? So look, uh, I'll be unfair to InfoEdge shareholders if I say we'll never sell. We are constantly alive to the issue. Sir, you will sell one day. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, you know, but, but as long as you, you know, we believe there's a future and there's growth, and uh, uh, you know, I see no reason to sell unless we need the money for something else, right? Uh, and that's what, but you know, obviously uh, we discussed with the board, but uh, there's no announcement we made here on this account, but, uh, uh, but, but I do believe that uh, if there's growth, we should stay. What gives you the confidence? You're speaking about the growth part. That growth is real. There are a lot of businesses which start young, but it's only when they start growing up the base effect or perhaps the need of that business gets challenged. Now, for you to grow, there are two things which is important. You have to solve the need of the society, which you are beautifully solving, but also pricing power and, and efficiency. What gives you the confidence? I think the confidence uh, which I get is from the behavior of the customer over time, right? I think there's a lot of people who are just starting to like, interact with restaurants. So, and I think maybe 70-80% of the base is right now four times a year kind of a frequency, which is doubling. Uh, that gives me the confidence. Like, even if we don't add any like, new people to the platform, even then we are going to continue growing for the next decade. So we're just at the early, It's I think it's a very, very early stage business right now. Profitable uh, as well. So. <laughs> Dibi, uh, it's always, you know, there's always a yes, no, there is no right and wrong, but mm -hmm. why is that startup founders have this maverick image? And there's an investor here, I'm going to ask him the same thing. but. That, there's an image, and this is not an India image, this is a global image, that startup founders are Mr. Mavericks of the world. 
I don't know. Why do you think so? I think that's more myths. I mean, if you're inside a startup, people are making rational decisions, rational choices. Uh, startup founders uh, very often tend to be young. Uh, they don't wear uh, suits and ties to office. Uh, I, I, I don't know, do you possess a suit and tie? No, I don't. And you don't have a suit and a tie? And I think given the recent news, there are so many large companies which have been taking maverick type calls, right? So it's not necessarily up to us. Like, so. It's just a young versus old image, I don't know. So, so look, when you, when you don't conform to stereotypes that society has in the past uh, you know, expected from uh, people in business, you're called a maverick sometimes. But it's OK, so long as the business is good, products are good, customers are happy, they're being serviced, and you're getting growth. It is also a question which has been asked, and I'm going to address with the uh, you know, you know, Actually, uh, like that, you know, yeah. if Dipindu will turn up, for a meeting or an office, you know, completely clean shaven and suit and tie and say, boss, is the business okay? <laughs> <laughs> but when was the last time you wore a suit? 15 years ago. Maybe. Actually? Mm -hmm. So when you meet your investors, even global investors, you don't have to wear a suit? I don't have to. And nobody don't. actually expects me to. I think if they see me in a suit, they would not buy the stock. <laughs> so one of the indicators now, apart from watching the valuation here, is that the suit cup and right. <laughs> that is the point which investors should look forward to, right? Possibly, possibly. <laughs> Possibly. The accounting disclosures, again, a lot has been talked about, not just Somato, but in general startup companies. The disclosures are changing. What about part two profitability? Will it keep on changing? This word adjusted this time attracted a lot of attention. Let's hear your thoughts. So I think uh, Zomato uh, releases a bit da, and then it gives adjusted a bit da. Now, what is EBITDA being adjusted for? It is being adjusted for a non-cash expense, uh, which is the charge this quarter of ESOPs awarded before the, just before the IPO. Right? Now, why is it useful for investors to know adjusted EBITDA? It's because real cash flows will give an indication of what the future might be like. Right? If you just give EBITDA, uh, you know, in the retail shareholders, for example, may or may not have the knowledge and expertise to remove ESOP and say, okay, this is what real cash flow is. Now, is ESOP a real expense? It is a real expense, no question about it. But the truth is that is it a real expense that's going to be repeated? Uh, thus far, at least, the thinking in the company is unlikely. And therefore, it is a one-time ESOP, but the it is being charged every quarter for the next X number of quarters. So therefore, I do believe it is a good disclosure but don't just look at adjusted EBITDA, also look at EBITDA. Whether it's, and Zomato reveals both. Whether it is, uh, you know, Policy Bazaar or PB Fintech or whether it is Zomato, a year ago, the general mood was that the path to profitability was not defined. I know markets are obsessed with it and we've asked you this question again and again because that's a benchmark. It is like saying that when you are in the public market and when you're private market versus public market, the arena has changed. Game change. Do you believe in that? Uh, so, market's obsession with part two profit. We, we invested in Zomato first uh, mm -hmm. in the year 2010, in June, right? Maybe maybe August, June, August mm -hmm. sometime. I think June we sent the term sheet and by the time the money went into the July, August. And I have correspondence from then, around October, November, asking Dipinder, saying, I want to see cash flow for next next three months. So they were doing one lakh of revenue. They just raised the money from us and we were already talking cash flow, and they gave us a prediction. So is Zomato, is Dipinder, is the management team uh, conscious, capable, aware of the importance of revenue, cash flow, profit? Uh, it certainly is, and it always has been. Now, in a market which was offering lots of capital, where competition was raising money, did they raise a lot of money? Yes, they did. Did they run up losses in order to get market share because competition was spending? Yes, they did. But uh, perhaps that was a smart thing to do then, right? But they've always been conscious of profit. In fact, in 2015, when there was a bit of a funding crunch in the market, they pivoted to very close to profit uh, in that year. So, Dipinder, if I say that for those who are obsessed with this entire concept of cash flow and path to profitability, they're missing on the big picture. It is like saying that you are, missed, you're, you are focusing on the trees, not the forest, because you are a high-growth company. And ultimately, when you are in a high-growth 
company which is solving the need of the society with innovation and with convenience. It's not one year, it's not two years. It's the, it's really a 10 year journey and which is where you would flourish. I think every company is built in a, di built in a different way, right? So, and some businesses take longer to get to profit, some take less time to get to profit, and sometimes things change as well. And um, I mean, path to profit, profitability, growth, all are part of the forest. Like, like, so I think you have to look at everything. There's no such thing as you can look at one thing and not really look at the other. You have, you have to look at everything at the same time. So I'll give you one yeah. instance, yes, right? Uh, you know, just a while back, I was sitting with uh, Dipinder, right? And you know, this company has an app where they track sales uh, live. Okay, so they can look at sales every hour. What are the growth over yesterday? Mm -hmm. What are the growth over last week in the same hour? Uh, you know, on, on the same day, for the full day. Mm -hmm. At 12.30 a.m., just past midnight, uh, they get a report on the app which says profit made yesterday. So you call him at 12.30 at night? I don't. Okay. He gets that. <laughs> he, no, I don't get it. He gets it, <laughs> right? So all I'm saying is that, right, uh, if there is a company that is uh, more capable in terms of their own consciousness and MIS and information and uh, awareness of what is the sale, what is the growth, what is the profit, they can track it to the minute and to the day. Uh, so this company, to my mind, is very well geared, all control systems, all reporting systems, to track uh, profitability, profit, and, and therefore they'll get there. Uh Buffett has this very famous quote which says that uh, for great companies, our holding period is forever. For you, does the matter fall in that category? It, it well might, uh, but uh, you know, but, but I, I don't want to say it because uh, I can't say that for my shareholders. What will be a trigger point for you to sell the matter? Could it be valuation? Or could it be you find something else? Because ultimately it's an investment for you and investors are not emotional about, about investments. Uh, so look, uh, the real issue is going to be, uh, is there growth left and over what time horizon, right? Uh, if Zamato goes to 150 tomorrow, should we sell? I don't know because it might go to 300 day after tomorrow and it might be go to 750 in five years. We don't know, right? So we'll, we'll not look at the stock price. We will look at the business fundamentals. Are they in the headed north? If they are, uh, will they keep on heading north if they will? I think it's a good thing to hold, if I unless, say, we, unless we need the money for something else. If I say, Dipinder, that Zomato has ambitions and it is working towards being India's biggest internet company, all platforms put together, and the ultimate goal is to be north of $100 billion, uh, will that be a tall order or that is something which is not a very high watermark for you? I mean, the watermark is certainly high, but I mean, we're trying to get there, right? So, and we are you working to towards work, it consciously? We are, we are actually working towards that consciously. So, if the again, a, whether it's a myth or a reality, the general view with again the startup and the internet companies is that they've got money when the interest rates were low, and they've got capital when interest rates were different. Now, cost of capital is going higher, but they will not change in terms of their attitude towards burning capital. It is a money which they've got by equity raising and they will continue to burn it. Is that a myth or there is serious? No, uh, see in my view, it takes six to nine months uh, for a young startup founder who's raised capital to really internalize that the market has shifted and changed, right? That he may now not get the same money so easily at such a valuation going forward. Once that relation sort of dawns on the founders, I think they're very agile and very quick and very smart at uh, pivoting. And we've seen that in company after company. So for those who think that, okay, you know, this <clears throat> entire internet, uh, uh, you know, mania in India was more like a bubble, it has got pricked. Do you think you would dismiss that? So let's look at past bubbles, yeah. right? Uh, let's look at 2000. Yeah. The TMT bubble. Yeah. Now at that time, it was a bubble and it did burst. And the, but the truth is, when that bubble burst, there were only 4 million internet users in India. Mm -hmm. So you were getting venture capital, you were getting a valuation, the market was potential only 4 million people. Mm -hmm. right? That reality has changed fundamentally. Today you have hundreds of millions, maybe a billion people, 
who are, and more coming on every day, who, who are using the net on the mobile uh, and are potential customers or, or eyeballs are important, right? And therefore, that fundamental has changed. So while valuations may, be, may have been frothy and they may correct, the underlying market size is real. And therefore, businesses will get built. Uh, sooner or later, profits will be earned, revenue will be earned, and companies will become valuable again. If India has to become a five trillion dollar economy, and we are not debating when, it is a matter of three years, five years, five, or six years. That's the debate what we have. Do you think companies like Zomato, or Policy Bazaar, or a Paytm, this entire internet cohort, will have a very large role to play? Um, certainly. So not just these three. I think many startups. So, so you know, if you look at, so I began. I joined the workplace. I, I, I joined industry, working in industry, in 1984, out of college. Right, that's about, uh, whatever, 39 years now. Uh, there's a sea change in the business landscape, uh, industry landscape uh, between then and now. It's not been a revolution, it's been an evolution. Right? But if I look back at, uh, you know, uh, much of the growth, much of the increase in employment, much of the increase in market cap, much of the, uh, the buzz, the investments, have come from companies and sectors that did not even exist in 1984, or barely existed. Yeah. IT services yeah. barely existed. IT enabled services did not exist. Internet did not exist. Mobile telephony did not exist. Uh, mobile apps did not exist, therefore. Uh, private sector airlines did not exist. Private sector banks, only a few legacy ones, but the big ones did not exist, right? Private sector airlines did not exist, right? Uh, PPP partnerships in infrastructure did not exist, right? These are all new initiatives. Very often, these new initiatives uh, are from first-generation entrepreneurs. Some are diversification of large companies like a TCS, but an Infosys, an HCL, they were startups in 1984. Now, you look at them today, let's take two companies, HCL and Infosys. Yeah. Startups in 84, when I began to work, giant companies today, look at the market cap. Uh, it's pretty clear, HDFC Bank did not exist. Yeah, yeah. Giant company today, look at the market cap. Uh, so it's pretty clear if that, if history is to repeat itself, that the giant companies of tomorrow, very many of them, are startups of today. Now, will these three specific companies do it? I hope they will. But in general, the family of startups will yield giant companies tomorrow. May not be five years, maybe 20 years, I don't know. But the future belongs to the startups of today. That's a great point, right? That if India has to become a three trillion to a five trillion dollar economy, the profit pool, which is what markets always focus on, the profit pool will come from the entire innovation or the startup space. Whether it is a matter of policy bazaar or you know patent, we don't know, but that is where what we should Hopefully, focus on. Hopefully, yes. And is that the right way in which your shareholders should look at it? Because we've addressed the true pillars: <laughs> customer satisfaction, employee concerns, and employee culture, something which you mm -hmm. alluded to. Now the shareholder, the third part. Mm -hmm. What should shareholders look to? Forward to? I think uh, it's about the intrinsic growth in the business, right? And the ability to make profit. And I think uh, the way I actually evaluate a startup is that if this company or this or the set of companies which actually compete in this particular space, they actually like shut down, will somebody cry? Okay. So if nobody is going to cry, then I don't think anybody has created value somewhere. Like, but if some people are going to cry, like then that's when there is actually real, uh, real value there. That's also when I think profit comes out of that state, right? So, and so, so I think Zomato is one of those uh, like companies where if we actually shut down, a lot of people would cry. Right? I'm going to cry for sure. No milkshakes for me. No late night <laughs> food for, cry me. for sure. No pizza well. for me. <laughs> <laughs> what is the one thing you constantly order on Zomato? Uh, I mean, uh, many things, okay? But uh, it's a Mughalai, biryani, all the stuff I don't get at home. <laughs> <laughs> Just to wrap it up with uh, one final point. What is that one advice which you always got from Sanjeev and you always ignored? A shareholder, right? May I promote uh, I know to, how to run my business. I think the, the biggest thing Sanjeev told me, and that was probably the first time or the second time he met me, was that there are two types of people or uh, two types of uh, startup founders or founders. Um, the ones who actually make it and the second type is the ones who quit. 
So there is no third type. Right? So, <laughs> so yeah, we, we have told him, we have told time. him that listen, we're giving you money. Whatever you do, don't quit. Don't say I'm going to do my MBA in the US now. I'm, you know, <laughs> I, I said I don't want to hear. Two years later, that now my MBA is done. I'm going to do my MBA. One last question. A lot of people look up to you to understand that. Uh, I mean, for just got Zomato right. They've got Policy Bazaar right. They've got a lot of other business right. And every time when you come on television, you are supposed to make a big prediction. So, where are you investing next? So we what don't are you looking at. We next? don't invest top down. Uh, we do it bottom up. So we don't look at sectors. You know, if in 2010 somebody had come and told me, hey, you know what? Look at the restaurant listing sector. Who is sector in there? Right? I was. We would not run Zomato. If in 2008 somebody had come and said, hey, you know, why didn't you look at insurance comparison? Then no company existed. We look at it bottom up. We meet startups and founders. And see the new interesting stuff. Doesn't make sense. And if it does, we back some of them, right? We sometimes get it right. We often get it wrong, right? But the ones we get right uh, more than make up for the ones we get wrong. Or the ones that are taking extra time. So it's bottom up. It's not top down. Uh, and we evaluate each on merit. We started uh, interaction with OG. Let's close with OMG. <laughs> <laughs> What is OMG moment for you? Uh, Well, a eureka moment for me. So, I'll give you two eureka moments. One was uh, policy bazaar, right? Policy bazaar we invested on a PowerPoint. The the, the product did not exist. Really? Yeah. No due diligence. I mean, we diligence the guys. What do you do in a PowerPoint? We diligence the guys. <laughs> <laughs> You're beating the Shark Tank promoters here. <laughs> no, no, we diligence the guys. So, uh, so, so no, uh, the founders had had experience in the same field, so there was domain expertise there. But Yashi sat across the table. From me, and he said, "I'm willing to bet that uh, you're paying uh, 60% more for your car insurance than you need to." 